How do you start a video on something you love? Not just respect, admire or like, but genuinely love. I suppose when you're in a relationship, you usually start by saying how the two of you met. So that's a good starting point for my love for a piece of fiction as well. VA11 Hall A, from this point on referred to as Valhalla, is a visual novel first released on PC in 2016. A project by a small Venezuelan studio called Sukeban Games that only had a small game jam project under their belt prior. It was met with enough success to warrant being ported to a Vita, PS4 and the Switch, as well as get a full Japanese translation. The tale takes place in Glitch City, a dystopian city-state of indeterminate future, where cutthroat corporate politics dictate lives and deaths of people, police in technologically advanced suits of armor brutalizes people without discrimination, assassins being easy to employ is an open secret, and nanomachines are spread out in the air as means of population control. And that hostile cyberpunk world leaves Julia Natalie Stingray, a bartender working in the eponymous bar. Valhalla is a story of mundane people in a fantastical setting. You don't run heists on corporate compounds, shoot protesters with a cool sci-fi gun, hack computers or sneak your way through streets with an APB on your head. You serve drinks. And not in a shadowy information broker who will tell you classified secrets if you buy a pina colada kind of way. Jill is a regular 27 years old woman with a job trying to survive day by day, with an obvious crush on her boss, a black cat and a childish sense of humor. In any other cyberpunk game, she would be an NPC with two lines of dialogue. Here she is the protagonist. I stumbled across the game by sheer chance a few days prior to its release. An article glanced on Twitter grabbed my attention with the visual style presented, a clear callback to PC-98 visual novels and as I would later learn, the silver case by Suda51 that the lead writer played, despite not speaking a lick of Japanese, and the overall style of the presentation made a huge impact on them. Which, yeah, makes sense, have you seen that fucking game? And then it retained that attention by telling me about the premise. It's a cyberpunk dystopia, and you just interact with the people of it as a bystander, mixing drinks and changing lives. You see, I'm the boring kind of person that burned out on heroics and stories of the best XYZ that ever lived years ago. So having this kind of perspective switch on this kind of setting I like sounded refreshing. And a bit vindicating, as I tried to roleplay a carpenter on an Ultima Online server as a teenager, only to find out that all the games and servers features are not exactly built to provide much variety and gameplay options for anyone that is not hacking and slashing. So. I thought to myself, perhaps a story built around such a mundane perspective from the ground up would vindicate my childhood urge, prove that I was right in thinking it can be an interesting facet of the world to explore. And it did exactly that. And oh, so much more. The game's plot takes place in December, like it did a Christmas title, like Die Hard or Yakuza 2. In fact, the developers invite people each year to play the game in sync with real life, one day per day from December 9th to New Year, and uh, yeah, I should have made this video before that, huh? Each day, Jill wakes up, bumbles around her apartment during the day, and then goes to work at night. The only piece of gameplay that there is, is mixing drinks. The customer requests something, either specific or vague, you crack open the recipe book and make it. There is no time limit, you can restart if you screw up any of the steps. It's a relaxing experience overall. Hell, when you start the game you get a message from the devs recommending you grab a drink yourself and just vibe to it. So yeah, don't go in expecting frills and epic gamer proficiency tests of your skills. Not sure why you would expect that from a visual novel in the first place, but regardless. There is some variety to the drink making. Sometimes what the customer says is not what they need. Sometimes you can take the conversation take a different direction by serving something with a name that alludes to something, and sometimes the drink says optional carmotrin, which means you can spike it with so much alcohol content that it becomes indistinguishable from Spiritus Retrificovane. As you can probably hear in the background, the music, composed by Garawad, specifically for this game, is amazing as well. Rather than having music be strictly tailored to specific scenes or characters, you get a jukebox to set a playlist of 12 tracks at the start of the day. 
I'll risk preaching to the choir and say that the track Every Day is Night Alone should have given this game at least a nomination for Best Soundtrack of 2016. But I also have a ritual. One of the tracks is called Welcome to Valhalla. So of course I said it first, and once I'm ready for the day, it's time to mix drinks and change lives. God, that feels so good, like an evening cigarette or a sip of mead after a hot bath. Just makes you feel like you're at the right place at the right time. Of course, as this is a novel, the writing is the core of what needs to be enjoyable about Valhalla. And this video wouldn't exist if I did not deeply, thoroughly enjoy it. The first layer of that is what I would call general writing. World building, news articles, implications about the world in dialogue and such. It's solid, but also very referential. Valhalla is very much a work of fiction created by someone who, on a deep level, enjoys fiction a whole lot. Hell, the subtitle for the game is Cyberpunk Bartender Action, a reference to Metal Gear Solid's tactical espionage action. However, it very much feels like a very deliberate, careful referencing. It never feels like someone screaming, how do you do, fellow nerds, because of the wealth and depth of references pulled from all media, other games, anime, movies, music and literature. Funnily enough, there seems to be some cross-collab between games published by Ipsert Games, and Yeek, or Y2K, is mentioned as a gigantic kit that gets new versions several times a year. Truly the darkest of dystopian timelines. Though there is also genuine writing conveying desperate struggle for basic necessities in Glitch City, in no small part co-written by the fact that the devs also lived in a country suffering from serious economic strife at that point, and sadly the thing that changed was their location, not Venezuela's woes. It also feels very reminiscent of Fortune's culture back when Fortune had a culture. God, I can't believe I'm being a boomer over an anonymous basket with an image board. If much less vulgar. To the point where Danger You, the in-game anonymous image board, is a mirror universe version of the real thing. There are no boys on the internet in Valhalla universe, for example, just like there were, obviously, no girls in the early 2010s internet. The plot structure itself is rather episodic. Every day brings different patrons, sometimes returning, sometimes new. There tends to be an overaching structure to the day itself, like on an episode of reality TV. There's a weird sound outside, or a streamer came into the bar, or a Christmas party is organized. There isn't really much of a general plot with a beginning, middle and end. Just people you get to know more and more intimately as they keep returning to the bar. The story concludes when there's nothing more to be said. Not with a bang, but with the last sip of your beverage of choice. And there's also two chasers you can access from the main menu. Short stories that happen before the main plot that served as the demos for the game. Gosh, Tidu, that sounds absolutely boring, I hear you say, Mr. Manstro. And let me tell you, yeah, you're probably right. If you enjoy nothing but action-packed explosion busters, it's probably not a story for you. Not really much else I can say here. But also, hey... What are you even doing on this channel? Didn't you realize I'm a boring crowd by now? The other layer of writing is, of course, the characters. And they're a very colorful, memorable bunch. A veterinarian that works for a company run by dogs, the chief editor of biggest newspaper in the region, an android sex worker, best boss, a cop that isn't a bastard, a rich person with a soul, George Constanza, the list goes on. Each with their story and piece to say, each with their preferred drinks, Admittedly, not all of them get the same amount of spotlight, and I am sad that some of them disappear altogether later in the game, but it's a testament to what a strong impression they all made that I did, in fact, remember enough of them to be bothered by it. In something that was a bit of a shock to 23 years old me, oh god, that sounds pretty sad when said out loud, the cast is also incredibly diverse when it comes to sexuality, which gets discussed a lot, especially in the later parts of the game, Nothing explicit is ever shown, but the cast is composed of nothing but adults, even if some of them don't look the part, and alcohol goes hand in hand with discussing sex. And it's probably one of the most tasteful depictions of the topic in media altogether that I've seen, discussing things like loneliness, comfort brought by closeness, anxiety caused by one's own sexual habits, general lust, past experiences, incompatible sexualities, unease of approaching someone you like, and gangbangs all in equal measures. It's very much a story about love, both physical and emotional, and the way it can be expressed. 
And speaking of love, it is absolutely no secret I adore Jill. I own a plushie of hers. She's been my avatar on social media for years now. She's the avatar of this very channel. I put the tag from that plushie in my wallet where a normal person would keep a photo of their spouse and kids. If there is a fan art of Jill that was made more than 24 hours from now, I have seen it. There's a 90% chance I have it saved on my hard drive. At the moment of me writing this script, that folder is 2002 files, 1.23 gigabytes large. At this point, I have dedicated hit squads sending me all the fun art they come across without me asking. One of them sent me a cute fun art as I was writing this sentence. The folder is now 2003 files large. Part of that is obviously last. In the weep circles, there is this notion of waifu, a term that came from how the word wife was pronounced in Azumanga Daio by the ever creepy Kimura sensei. Dare. My waifu. A fictional character you feel strong affection for, strong enough to spend money on her figurines, buy a high quality model of her for a porn game of Gumtree for three dollars, consider getting a hugging pillow and dream of her blowing cigarette smoke in your face. And Jill is a beautiful, wonderful woman that makes me smile when I read her talk with people, and I also want to die with my windpipe crushed by her thighs. But that's just part of the connection, naturally a lasting one. Last is nothing, if not fickle. And it's definitely not stable enough to make the object of my pinings a part of my online identity, including this channel. There is something more. I suppose the youth of Tumblr would call it kinning a perceived close association of the character's traits with your own. And there's superficial stuff there, to be sure. I also have a terrible sense of humor. I was a stupid edgelord as a teenager, and Jill is probably one of the best portrayals of a person with an attention deficit disorder in games. She spends her day thinking about something, and if that urge is not taken care of, she's completely distracted from work, forgetting what the customer has just ordered. And as someone that has issues getting to the task at hand before the previous one is cleared from my mental queue, even if that previous one is something like getting a pack of Skittles, I relate. But there is a much closer link, one that the devs could in no way predict, but one that tied me to this cute bartender for life. And as I am about to get spoilery and sappy, here's a timestamp if you want to avoid that. I'll try to be as vague about the spoilers as possible, but some details are unavoidable. And three, two, one, off you go. About halfway through the story, it's revealed that Jill is haunted by one bad breakup. She got into a serious relationship with a student teacher when she was at university, but one day she found herself realizing she only went through the motions with her education and the perspective of doing that her entire life made her fly into panic. She received an offer to work straight out of college in a research facility, her girlfriend accepted it on her behalf without consulting it with her, it spiraled out into an argument and Jill left. Not knowing what she should do in life, but knowing she did not want it to be that. And I felt that. In 2016, when the game first came out, I was a college dropout. A year prior to that, I studied psychology and felt the same subject for the third time, once repeating just it, once the entire year. And as I looked at the results in the professor's office, I felt nothing, maybe even relief. I put so much into that course that I did not want to live off my own volition, but the more I learned, the less I cared. At best, I would not use that knowledge in my life. At worst, I would be a horrible therapist. Thankfully, I did not hurt anyone I love on my way out, except for maybe my parents' image of me. And the year after that was very hard for me as I found myself completely aimless. But if I stayed my course there and put more into studying, working in the field now, years later, I would be miserable. And to see someone, even a fictional someone, go through the same thing at roughly the same point in my life was cathartic. Kinda gave me hope that even if I don't know what my life will be in the future, it will definitely be something. And that was more than I hoped for at that point. When I played the game, I was 23. Probably around the same age that Jill would be during that breakup. Now, I am 28 a year older than her immortal digital self. I finished education in a field of study that I found fulfilling, philosophy, even if it is financially worthless. 
I've spent those five years teaching English to kids and adults alike, meeting a plethora of interesting people on a pretty personal level due to the nature of such work. Now, I'm a corporate sellout with a stable income, doing bad little YouTube videos in my spare time that I really enjoy working on. And half a year from now, I'm going to get married. It's been an interesting life, and I hope it stays interesting going forward. And because of all of this, even if the details don't always perfectly match, there is no way I can get Jill out of my soul. And I fully believe her life would turn for the better on her next birthday, as it did for me. And I hope to see her again someday, someplace, telling me how her life was boring and uneventful, but happy. And the nerds who have skipped spoilers will be back in 3, 2, 1. So that's it for me gushing about the game. But to love is to see words and all. And I do think Valhalla has some flaws. As mentioned before, I think some characters had unexplored potential and I would love to see more of them. There's also some CG arts, but they feel very undetailed and low res. Something that usually adds variety to visual novels felt somewhat out of place, not to mention it only happens a few times for rather inconsequential scenes. I have a feeling that these were done early in development, and a few were done before devs moved on to other means of varying up the gameplay, like one-on-one -on -one scenes, or this absolute banger 10 out of 10 greatest of all time interactable scene where Jill and Dana sit on a balcony drinking beers and you can just pop Jill full of alcohol to kill any inhibition she might have in front of her crush? <sighs> you know how I talk about choices mattering in video games? I mean exactly that, baby. Don't make me an arbiter of everyone's life and death. Make me a part of the world, vulnerable to all of its little vices and perks. Just Mwah. So, in conclusion, yeah, it's December, go get it. It's maybe 20 hours in total, if you're a freak like me that is willing to play a shoot 'em up minigame for all the chivos. It goes for cheap on Steam and is discounted often. I don't know if you will find it as deeply impactful as I did, if you will love all these characters as much as I did. But that's always the risk when looking for a new drinking hole. You never know if you'll vibe with the local and stuff or not. But nothing risked is nothing gained. And sometimes getting burned feels better than not feeling anything at all. Sukeban Games are currently working on a new project, Nirvana, about a high-class restaurant in a fake paradise created for the rich, with the new protagonist, Sam, being designed as a complete opposite of Jill, an extroverted, talkative mom. I can see the potential for lightning striking twice. Showing two opposite sides of the same world is definitely a concept with a lot of promise, giving the devs narrative and artistic freedom to explore what was previously implied and unseen. What I'm wondering is where they would go from that point. Hopefully, in the dark future of the year 20xx, they will surprise us with yet another banger. Merry Christmas, or whatever your December holiday of choice is, and a Happy New Year. And that's the last video of the year. What will 2022 bring? More plague probably, but as for this channel itself, eh, I don't know, we'll see. The January video might be late, as me visiting my family for holidays entails a lot of train rides that usually leave me exhausted. This video was made possible thanks to the wonderful patrons of the bar, now visible on the screen. We also received a tip on coffee from a certain someone only known as E. Thank you.